Bonjour tout le monde! Welcome back to We in France. I'm Diane, and this is where we talk about everyday French life and beyond. Now, today I have another cultural comparison video for you where we're going to be getting into six little things that French people do differently than Americans. And please keep in mind, I've chosen to focus on things that I have not talked about at length here on the channel and other videos just to keep it fresh so it's not a list of things you've heard a hundred times elsewhere before. And Thank you to Fab French Insurance for sponsoring this video. For all your insurance needs in France or for your French visa insurance, definitely check out Fab French Insurance via the link below. They'll get you squared away. And uh, with that, let's get into number one. Okay, number one, how fitting. I'm starting with numbers, both the way we count from one to five with our hands and the way we write numbers. So first, let's jump in with the counting part. In most of the US, many of us count from one to five like this. We go one, two, three, four, and five. So if we wanna say we'd like two of something, uh, we would do this in the US, two. Now in France, one to five is a little different. They go one, two, three, four, and five. So if you want three of something, you'd go like this, three. Now, in my own videos, people have commented on how I count with my hands. Sometimes I mix it up. I use the French way on purpose. I'll use the US way, or sometimes I'll just do something weird, like number three, and I don't know what that is. I just do it for fun. But um, let's switch over to the writing thing. Now, let me put something up on screen for you. We have Tom, my French husband, uh, on the top here, uh, writing out one through nine, and underneath we have my own American handwriting. Now, I will say these days, I do put a bar across my sevens, um, but I never used to before moving to France. So if you look at this, you'll see a few differences. For me, the French four is not always clear. Um, sometimes ones can look like non-barred sevens, and usually French people write their nines with a little hook underneath, uh, like it's a lowercase g. So those are just some differences to be aware of there when you are looking at numbers written by French people. Okay, number two, leaving your left blinker on when you're passing a car on the highway for the entire time until the pass is complete. Complete. Now you'll see this all the time on the French highways, the autoroute, and at first I thought it was just a matter of drivers just being a little forgetful with their blinker, you know, leaving it on the whole time by accident. But after seeing it enough, it became clear to me that it really is a thing that French people do. So Tom confirmed it's how a pass is done here. Now technically, the code de la route, you know, the driver's handbook and all that legal stuff, they do require a driver to signal their intention to pass but to not leave the blinker on that entire time. But, but, there's always a but, at driving school though, you are usually taught to leave your blinker on when you pass a car, or just a few cars in a row on the auto route. But generally, you turn it off if you're gonna stay in that left lane for a while, maybe to pass five or six cars over the course of a few minutes. But I guess all of that can be a little confusing, so French people just simplify it by leaving that blinker on that whole time they're passing uh, cars in the left lane. And that generally is not done in the US. In US roads, at least where I've driven, we generally put on our left blinker to signal to cars around us that we're gonna initiate a pass. Then we get in that left lane, we turn our blinker off while we get ahead of the car or cars that we're passing on the left. And then we put that right blinker back on to change lanes uh, to get back in front of the cars that we, we pass to complete the pass. Or if you're from my home state of New Jersey or you're in New York, blinkers are optional. <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of. Okay, number three, or should I say three or three? Uh, no, that's four. Uh, <laughs> drinking a hot drink like coffee or hot chocolate in a bowl. And these bowls, I'll put a picture up here, they're sometimes called bol à café au lait, and they're footed ceramic bowls that you'll find in all different colors. And while of course you can use them for cereal, oatmeal, soup, they're commonly used for hot drinks at breakfast breakfast in France. I did a whole video on breakfast if you want to check that out. But all you do is you fill up your bowl with your drink, you pick it up with both hands, and you sip away like this. And Tom explained to me that when he was a kid, that would be mostly how people would drink their café au lait, that coffee with milk, or something called chicoré, chicory I think it is in English. And that's just a drink, a plant-based drink made from a flower in the dandelion family, and it has kind of a nutty, 
earthy taste, very popular in the north of France and with the older generation. Now that said, it is getting trendy as a coffee alternative with the younger crowd because it is produced locally and it's healthy. Now, people have it either on its own or mixed with coffee and it's something you could easily find in grocery stores, the chicorée. Now, Tom also told me that as a kid, he'd have his hot chocolate in the morning in a bowl like this and, you know, mugs with a handle like this one from my shop. They're not something that you would commonly see in France back in the day, um, hence the use of bowls. But check out my mugs, my other Francophile merch, including a shirt like this uh, down below in the description. If you're into that sort of thing, it's a great way to support my channel and get some cool Francophile gear. Okay, number four, paying by check. Yes, it's 2022 and checks are quite commonly used in France. Now, many people do use their debit cards. Of course, it's normal to pay by card, but it is perfectly within reason of normal behavior to whip out your checkbook at the grocery store. To me, what feels like, like it's 1995. Now, it tends to be senior citizens who do this or around that age group, but grocery stores aside, checks are pretty common commonplace in society in general, so much so that you'll see signs at the register in stores or even at restaurants to say checks are not accepted due to fraud concerns, which just shows that they're still out there and they're used. And everyone pretty much has a checkbook or they're at least offered a checkbook when opening a bank account. Now, checks are also used to pay rent by people who don't wanna set up that direct deposit each month with their landlord. And they're also used for deposits on apartment rentals. So let's say you, you rent an apartment with a French person, they'll ask you for a deposit of a certain amount when they leave you the keys for the house in case you break something just for them, you know? And so you do that in the form of a check and usually at the end of the visit, at the end of your vacation rather, you give the house back in the same condition as when you arrived, all is good and they rip up that check and no worries. Okay, number five, undershirts for men under their dress shirts. Now, in my opinion, it's quite popular in the US for men to wear an undershirt of some sort under their dress shirt for work. You know, the ones that button up, they have a collar, like typical corporate wear. And that way the nice shirt is protected from sweat discoloration uh, with that thin cotton layer. It's like a t-shirt, right? A, a thin white t-shirt between your shirt and your skin. Now in France and maybe even Europe in general, wearing an undershirt in this way under your work dress shirt is much less common. And Tom, he weighed in when I told him about this one. He's like, quote, I've never seen a French person wearing one in my entire life end quote. So that's not to say you won't find a French guy wearing an undershirt ever or that all Americans everywhere wear one. But overall, I find that they tend to be more common with working men in the US and not so much in France. Now, all that said, back in the day in France, like way back, Tom's grandpa or maybe even, I don't know, maybe even his great grandma, grandpa, some of the French people I spoke with told me that they'd wear something called a maillot de coeur. And they're popular back in the day, something that we would call a wife beater these days. So it just goes to show you that things go in and out of style. And please, Europeans and non-Europeans, please let me know down below in the comments if you're a man or maybe about the man in your life, if he wears an undershirt under his dress shirt and let me know if you're European or not and your rough age group. Just, just curious about that. Okay, number six, we have ring and shoe sizing. They're different in France. So to start with the US, ring sizing is numerical so that at a jewelry store, you would say you wear a five or a five and a half. But ring sizing is not the same in France. Here, it's still numerical, but it's a different numbering system. A US ring size of five and a half is, I believe, a 51 and three quarters in the French numbering system. And I think the Germans and the Swiss use an entirely different numerical system just to, just to complicate things. And then I think the UK and Australia, they use an alphabetical system where if you say you were an M or an N or something like that, uh, like an M and a half or an N and a half. So you have to let me know about that below, guys. I'm familiar with the, the ring sizing in France and in the US, but not so much on the other countries. All right, with shoes now, European sizes are generally in the 30s and 40s. So a US women's nine here in France, I would wear a 39 or 40, depending on the brand. And let me point out, this excludes the UK, who as usual, wanted to do things differently. And just to give you an example on that, uh, Tom, he loves this UK shoe brand for work. It's a little bit frustrating, he, he's told me, with the different systems because you can't even find two equivalency charts that are the same. So, you know, and that's the same case with rings. Sometimes something will say five and a half is a French this, or it's a half size smaller, and it can be really annoying if you're ordering online. Unlike the US, where a men's nine and a women's nine, they're not the same size shoe when you actually measure it. 
In France, sizing is standard. So regardless of if you're a man or a woman, a 40 is a 40. So a women's high heel shoe 40 is the same as a men's dress shoe and a 40. It just makes sense. And Tom told me he's always found it kind of odd to have different sizes for different genders. I guess those numbers, they're, they're used, they're based on real measurements in the end, you know, centimeters or, or inches. So why have two different ones? It doesn't really make things easy for the consumer. And it even made him feel weird once. He told me he tried on some sneakers, I think, in, in some store before realizing that, you know, the US sizing was different. And the shoes that he liked, that he put on, they were women's shoes. <laughs> and because he, he didn't really know that up front, after he realized, you know, psychologically, he didn't like the shoes anymore, thinking, oh gosh, they're supposed to be for women's. They're a women's size. I don't want them anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I had never really thought about how we have men's and women's shoe sizing in the US uh, until I came to France. And realized a 40 is a 40, regardless of uh, if it's a male shoe or a shoe for, for women. And um, as I always say, these things are not a judgment of what each country does better or worse. I'm just pointing out some of the differences between the two because I found them super interesting. And it's just a way that if you know about them, it might better prepare you for your trip to France. And speaking of that, I do have an e-guide linked down below. It has 75 tips, mostly beginner tips. So if you've never been to France or you came to France years ago and you want to brush up on all things French, check it out down below in the description for some helpful tips for your French vacation. I also have a newsletter and all kinds of fun things linked below, including, like I said, merch where you can grab this shirt and my mug. As always, I want to mention again, thank you to my sponsor, Fab French Insurance, for sponsoring this content. And whether you need a compliant insurance policy for your visa or car insurance or that sort of thing, do not stress because Fabien and his team, they can help you out in perfect English and get you the best deal for whatever insurance you need. So check them out as well. Really, that's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you so much for being here and I'll see you back here on We in France soon. Salut!